Hello and welcome. I'm Somesh Verma. Let's consider some data today. In this world, every five seconds, one child under the age of five dies from hunger or malnutrition-related disease. Every four minutes, one person loses his or her eyesight for the lack of vitamin A. More than 852 million people globally do not get enough food each day to sustain a normal life. Sometimes it makes you wonder, is everybody equal? Is right to food not for everyone? Does human rights have much meaning if it's not for everyone? Can we imagine a world free of hunger in which every woman, man and child can fully enjoy their human rights in dignity, particularly the right to adequate food? To talk about these, today we have two guests in our studio, Dr. Anna Maria, who is FIAN International Representative in Geneva, and Dr. Keshav Kharka, an economist. Welcome to our show. Hello. Can, can we start with uh, Anna? Yeah. How do you define right to food? Because we know, as we speak, a lot of people across the world are hungry. Yeah. So we talk as food as a right when we say that everyone should have uh, the possibility to claim to the state for them to have access to adequate food which is av available all the time in a sustainable manner. That sa sounds quite complicated but the most important thing is that states should respect the right of people which means they should not interfere mm -hmm. when people already have the way to have their food, to have their income. Second, they should protect people which means if others like non-state mm -hmm. actors business companies, mm -hmm. landlords, come and impede that people feel themselves the states should regulate, protect, monitor, or even sanction uh, those actors. And third, the state should fulfill, which doesn't mean uh, giving food. It's not the mm -hmm. idea of providing food, but is the idea of putting all the measures necessary to ensure that people can feed themselves. And just for those who are not able to feed themselves, you or the state would have the obligation to provide adequate food within a strategy, which means um, that you shouldn't make people dependent of this food aid or food assistance, mm -hmm. but give them the food until they are able to feed themselves. And for that, states so, should so adopt strategies. We'll move to Keshav. Dr. Keshav, do you think a country like Nepal has enough capacity to do this. Thank you. And uh, that enough capacity, how to define? Exactly, that's your job. Of <laughs> that's, that's the problem. Uh, if you take the things uh, as a liability of a state, then every citizen has a uh, right mm -hmm. you know, from the very birth to claim over his livelihood with the state. Because he is a citizen. Mm -hmm. And citizen's livelihood, a citizen's life is the prime thing the state should care. But regarding, as Anna has already explained, you know, the, uh, it is not the duty of the state to provide food for everyone, but to create a condition. Sometimes, you know, uh, in the Nepalese condition, the food production is not the problem. We have sufficient food. But the problem is uh, the access, mm -hmm. the social mapping, mm -hmm. you know. How, how do we differentiate here? Uh, access to food, when, I mean, we say that there's enough food for everyone, yeah. yet people are going hungry. Yeah. How does it come about? Yeah. Because uh, there is the, uh, you know, so socio-economic factors leading to that thing. Mm -hmm. There's access to resources, food producing resources, or the enough income, or the employment generation. There are so many things which affect the access. Access means there are two types of access. One is economic and another is social. Mm -hmm. you know? Sometimes we have economic access means uh, you should have enough means to purchase the food required for your livelihood or for your standard uh, life and that purchasing power, the capacity enhancement of that purchasing power, it is related with the economic aspect of access to food uh, at available food price you should have that much income or that much resource that you can buy food. Mm -hmm. Another is social access. And social access is the most important thing uh, in our context. Because we have different social hierarchies on the one hand, and the economic resources are, uh, you know, sometimes correspond to the different social hierarchies. Mm -hmm. 
uh, uh, closer to, to the state power you are, or in a beneficial position, then you have better resources than the otherwise. So it's, it brings in a question, should this happen to food? I mean, just because I'm more powerful, I have access to food, and somebody who's less powerful doesn't have access to food. That's what we are trying mm -hmm. to avoid from the human rights approach. We don't want to uh, get away to anybody the food they have, but we want to avoid that people have you abuse, and that can be state actors. So basically we're talking about, I have enough, so I waste a lot. <laughs> you don't have, so you don't get at all. Yeah. yeah, that's one thing. But the other thing is that many times also people are uh, get uh, are victims or of mm. other people who are getting them away the resources they need, for example, food, and that's not necessary in the same country. Mm -hmm. It can also be that foreign investors come to Nepal and decide to put a huge hotel in the best places and all the people who are living there and, and having their livelihoods there are evicted and then they do not have any possibility to continue. Normally it happens in case of big dams and when these are constructed you see a lot of uh, farmers being displaced and put in an area where they cannot grow anything and they, they eventually their means of earning and eventually means of having food is, is diminished. Yeah. Exactly. So are we talking about that? Exactly. And what we normally here is that every country is responsible for the people living in their country. That's like the domestication mm -hmm. of human rights. But in fact, it creates a gap of protection because more and more in the world, in the globalized world, mm -hmm. you have situations where many countries or many actors are involved. You can, for example, have a Swiss, Swiss hedge fund mm -hmm. investing in a project from Indian enterprises building a dam between India and Nepal and on the end affecting the indigenous people from Nepal. So that's why we are trying at FIA not So this basically means that uh, if even, let, let, let's talk about, yeah. if we're talking about India and Nepal for example, India also has obligation to people of Nepal. Yeah. Uh, but normally this is not in practice. Can we force this? Exactly. Yeah. That's, that the problem is mm -hmm. that after the Second World War, we were thinking in international categories. And more and more, this, the situation was being reduced to a state with their own inhabitants. What we are trying to do now is to create at international level, in international law, in regional law, and in national law, the rules that we need to make, for example, in this mm -hmm. case, Indians mm -hmm. responsible for violations that they are causing to people living in Nepal. The problem is that in many cases it's not just one country, so mm -hmm. you can have the money coming from the USA, from Switzerland, the Indian investors, some Nepali officers which mm -hmm. are implied, and it means you have to have a broad regulation which allow us to make all responsible. Saying that India is responsible doesn't mean getting away the responsibilities that the Nepali authorities could, could have mm -hmm. in the case. For example, if they give a concession without uh, having impact assessment on what would happen with the people if they give this contract to the other in the investors coming from other countries and so on. And that's why we are working on what we call the extraterritorial obligations of states mm -hmm. in the area of economic, social and cultural rights, trying to have adequate law at international level, but also remedies so that people can claim, in this case of the dam, mm -hmm. for example, in Nepal, but also in India or maybe at the UN. Dr. Kishav, I'd, I'd just like to come to you. Normally, states would think about the benefits. It's, it's also always about revenues. Like we talked about, uh, let's say, a big multinational company coming to Nepal, maybe in near the border town. All Nepali government would be concerned about getting revenue, whereas this might create an implication for Nepali people there as well as Indians on the border side. Yeah. How easy is it to negotiate there? Oh, that's a I mean, it, first diplomatic thing, First thing is, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it is difficult to negotiate with Nepali government first yeah. for Nepali people yeah. who would be suffering. Yeah. And eventually, uh, even Indian government would yeah. need to negotiate with Nepal yeah. for their own people. How easy is this? Yeah. Uh, it is not the matter of uh, whether it is easier or uh, hard. That depends on diplomatic maneuvering. The fact is that any kind of uh, activity should not lead to a condition where the traditionally uh, food resources are reduced. 
when the traditionally available food are restricted because of that development activity. Sometimes, uh, just uh, Mary, I was uh, referring to that Lakshmanipur Baan, mm -hmm. you know, which we have been a uh, very much uh, well-known case, and your popular media has mm -hmm. also raised so many issues. Uh, because uh, it is not the uh, bad thing that India should have a good marriage and get irrigation and more food for the Arab people. That's her duty. But while she is discharging this duty, she should also take care of the upper riparian country, Nepal, and our people. Because of that uh, afflux bond, the uh, paddy fields in Nep Nepalese mm. side should not get drowned. And there the crops rotten. So that's the extraterritorial obligations which we it, have. Is it, is it not very so that means, uh, that means, it, you know... It also when, looks very complicated, doesn't it? No, no, it, it is Isn't not complicated. Mm -hmm. While you are initiating some project like but that... But I think it's then, very complicated no, then, when it comes to uh, negotiating. No, no, that negotiation mm -hmm. is very at the very much inception period, mm -hmm. you know, because if you uh, get the idea that there is uh, right of the people, ESCR, economic, cultural and social rights, should not be... Uh, disturbed due to this activity, if you got that idea while well, it is at the initial period. Fair enough. There, there's, 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 there's nothing it, it, denying that yeah. you cannot harm the rights of yeah. people, yeah. right to food. Yeah. I, but I'm, I'm just asking, maybe Anna can explain here, that is it not complicated when it comes to in implementation? I think it is very complicated because we have like contradictory commitments in our governments. Mm -hmm. On one part, we have countries which have signed the international obligations and uh, treaties saying we commit to respect human rights, dignity, special, especially for those marginalized or disadvantaged. And on the other side, we have officers who just are thinking on how to make business. So at some point, to bring these both together makes the situation very difficult and more difficult when you have two, three, four actors interested in the business. Well, I'm asking this because mm, traditionally we have states which are used to making wars. We still have conflicts in many regions mm. of the world where one conflicting party would try to harm the, all the interests of the other con yes. conflicting party. So how easy can it be? I mean, whatever you're saying, I'm not denying that. But the yeah. problem is it sounds all too all too good to be true, yeah. doesn't it? It is, but it is not, because we already have some cases when we have had good precedents. For example, we have the so-called Oiskadi case. This was a case in which European investors had a company, um, the cars, wire wheels, uh, in Mexico. And at some point they decided to close the company, letting 2,000 people without work, which means without food, for their and their families. And then uh, we began doing lobby and advocacy work with the German parliament and with the European parliament and putting pressure. And some of our members bought shares in the assembly of the company. And when the, the shareholders noted that this company let people without food, they decided to reopen the company and they decided to pay all the debts they had to the workers with the help of the company. And now these people have again the work. So mm -hmm. in the big context of war and so, of course, it's difficult, but we can but again, tackle we, some issues. Dr. Keshav, you can explain mm -hmm. this. Probably yeah. we're talking about a few cases. There are, and in, in recent mm -hmm. years, uh, starting 2008, yeah. where we have uh, entire world seems to be in recession, yeah. most of the companies, they're closing down their wings in various developing worlds, which leads to eventually yeah people without work and, of course, without food. Yeah. This but example sounds good, but how realistic is yeah. this in case of entire global perspective? Yeah. Uh, in global perspective, you know, we are living in a completely new world. You are right that in the past there are some uh, mishappenings or wars between the states. And even today, it is not free of all these things. But in spite of all these things, uh, we are living in a completely new world in the sense that uh, the multinational corporations, the mobility of people across the border, and all these uh, economic activities depending on, uh, you know, economic uh, cooperation, uh, sometimes, you know, economic partnership, mm -hmm. uh, so that one part of the things, uh, same manufacturing, goes in one country and another in home country, and this type of things are there. So, uh, it is the beauty of globalization, you know, 
but globally we are one community like thing mm -hmm. so in this change perspective if we think the traditional way uh, how to resolve things by force or using these all things then naturally we will lead to a zero condition so the whole idea is redefine the problem yeah, find new solutions. yeah. yeah. This, this extraterritorial obligation it is redefined uh, mm -hmm. it is uh, simply the manufacturing of i think the uh, intellectuals you know mm -hmm. Uh, the, 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 from uh, 40 or more than uh, 40 universities in the mass. Wait, wait, uh, wait. Where, uh, invasion of world. With, yeah, a new, uh, they are inventing a new kind of paradigm mm -hmm. so that we can leave, we can uh, harmonize our resources. That sounds pretty uh, possible. To protect uh, but I'll just rights. come to Anna because yeah. we, we're running out of time. Who are biggest villains? The states or the multinationals? So from the human rights approach, you always talk about states being the violators, but now we cannot close the eyes and say many of the breaches have been caused by activities of transnationals. Of course, not every company is a violator. We mm -hmm. should have that clear. But more and more we see that in specific areas, as agribusiness or extractive industries, all the mines, uh, more and more the companies are, and we could say that they are in complicity relationship with states so and have power over many states so because to say one or the other is difficult normally have because such they a big cloud that they, they influence the state and there are a lot of money monetary kickbacks yeah. Yeah. Known of this. so that's why we are uh, looking in our very difficult work as you mm. mentioned for an international human rights court where we would be able to bring the states and the companies because we know at the national level it's very difficult to get justice in many cases not in all the cases so if we would have the possibility to have decisions of judges which we could enforce coming from the international level that would support the victims because on the end all that is really to support people suffering and hunger of malnutrition and Normally, this hunger and malnutrition is not because people are lazy or because mm -hmm. they grew up in this or that region, but really because of relations of power, and we have to try to correct to different mechanisms that we are developing. Uh, I know it's mm. not a, a, a really easy task, but other ways uh, it would not be but a There task. are some things you have <laughs> to do, whether it's easy or not. Yeah. And we'll come to Dr. Kish. Yeah. We, th there are uh, enough experts who say that food problem is, is because we're not growing enough. Yeah. But there are yeah. some who say that we are growing enough food yeah. to feed the entire population on this yeah. planet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How can there be two different views about the same yeah. thing? Population yeah. is same. Yeah. Uh, probably food production is at it least is it's same. measurable. Yeah. So yeah. how can uh, we have to uh, No, um, uh, the easiest way to understand is that uh, uh, that agriculture or food producing as a livelihood matter or as a profit making. If you go on the multinational agribusiness uh, organizations and big large farmers, commercialization mm -hmm. of farming and commercialization of the life sustaining food items, uh, which sustains the life of a human being, it is compared with uh, these uh, you know, mobiles and cars and this all that. That's quite different. So if you do not commercialize the things, commercialize your view, then you see that the food production is enough. Because every people have their own geographical background, they have their own biodiversity-based resources, which can produce the locally sufficient food to them. So if you think that the, uh, what you call that uh, um, uh, monoculture, mm -hmm. monoculture of food, wherever you go, you should have dinner, wherever you, you go, you should have lunch in mm -hmm. that pattern, and that packet, uh, a set of foods, there are this and that and that item, then there is a scarcity of food. But if you believe in the diversity of human uh, environment, natural environment, and cultural environment, and the food beauty of variety of foods, you know? So, so one, one uh, mm -hmm. you know, intellectual that, uh, the accommodation is that if given these resources, we can feed uh, till it is beyond 12 billion. So that's, we are that, that's, 7 that million. Sounds, we, we're still in surplus. So, yeah, and we I are quite to you, Why are we uh, not understanding that there's enough food? Why are tr we trying to commercialize? I think we don't want to understand, especially yeah. those making business of food. Yeah. Because when we talk about food, we talk mm -hmm. about food having 
an economic dimension, but also a cultural and a social dimension, which means, for example, when you produce food, you meet with your partners in the fields or you go to the market or the mother feeds the baby. And all that creates social cohesion and reflects cultural patterns. But when you just think in food as business, it is good to say that food is not enough because then you have you, you can justify more what and you're you can doing ask for more. and you and you can play with prices. But the prices. point is, there is enough food for everyone on this planet. It's yeah. what the FAO is saying, the international so organization. Let's accept to that, and hopefully, uh, the world becomes free of hunger. Thank and you right very much. Is respected. Thank you Namaste. so much for coming. In. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Sure. That was Dr. Anna Maria and Dr. Keshav Kharga. We talked about people's right to food and food security issues. Keep watching Tandiku Television. Thanks for watching so far.